You are listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris White. And today our guests are Dr. Daisy Sherry and Dr. Tina Bobo. Today we're going to be talking about nursing. So Professor Sherry and Professor Bobo are faculty here at Lewis University, um, and they are both part of the nursing faculty. And so doctors Sherry and Bobo, can you tell us a little bit about your pathway, your degrees, and um, tell us a little bit about nursing? Like, what are you a doctor of? I think that's our first question. Well, thank you for the question. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so I have a PhD in nursing. Um, it is a PhD just like any other PhD in science or in, you know, topic du jour. Um, right. So they have to complete, you know, a series of philosophy, of statistics, and all of that fun stuff. Um, and so I completed my program in 2010 um, in order to become a professor and do research. So I wanted to be a professor slash scholar um, with my Ph.D., what did you research in nursing for your PhD? So my research was based in the clinical setting. Um, at the time, I was a nurse practitioner at University of Chicago, and I saw that there was uh, a lack of resources for our patients that I saw that were receiving a cardiac resynchronization therapy device. Oh, okay. CRT for short. It's a type of fancy or Cadillac uh, type of defibrillator that patients receive when their heart is too big or their heart um, tends to beat too fast. So it's like a pacemaker, but a fancy version? Kind of. They kind of look the same. So if you had each on a table, you wouldn't be able to like see it with your eye as different. But the purpose of them is different. Pacemaker is to help your heart beat when it, the heart rate is naturally too slow. Okay. Defibrillator is to stop that fast rhythm if the heart naturally goes too fast. Oh, okay. I didn't know the difference. And then Dr. Bobo, Tina, can you tell us about your? Sure. Um, I actually met um, Dr. Sherry over 20 years ago. We worked together at University of Chicago Hospitals nice. back then. Um, so I pursued my degree here at Lewis, the, doctor, the Doctorate of Nursing Practice degree here at Lewis. Um, I became interested in doing research on um, opioid safety because oh, okay. that was my background. I did pain management for about 20 years at Edward Hospital. So um, I knew that in the acute setting, when patients have severe pain, opioids are necessary. And you would feel the same. Sure. <laughs> using you as an example, <laughs> if you were in severe pain, we did lots of things to minimize opioids, um, to do like multimodal therapies so that we could minimize the use of opioids. But in the end, opioids were necessary. So I did a lot of initiatives there related to opioid safety, and I decided that I wanted to um, – to be able to do some research and publish about that so that um, smaller hospitals um, and people who were not specialists in the area could have a better understanding of that. So um, my project was on a disposal, safe disposal of opioids at the end of an episode of care. So I shouldn't flush them down the toilet. Well, actually, the FDA does say for those medications that are considered a huge safety risk on their website, they recommend that there's a list literally of 15 medications. Opioids are one of them. Oh, okay. That because they're such a risk that they do recommend that you flush those down the toilet. Now, there are other ways, and I could go on and on, but <laughs> the bottom line is I was able to secure a $200,000 donation of these disposal packets that had um, – it's basically like a pod, like you think a Tide pod of uh, activated charcoal. And by putting the medications in it, made their molecules become inert. So deactivated the medications, almost 100% of all medications. And then it made it safe to dispose in the household trash. Oh, and okay. So I just documented uh, patients' uh, willingness to dispose with education on the importance of that. Oh, okay. Then I will flush. No, I'm kidding. 
I don't I, have opioids. Yeah, the, the message I got there is make sure that nobody gets access to these things. So right. do what you have to do to get them yes. right. away from, you know, potential abuse. Right. Yeah. Very cool. I'm very impressed. Um, I, I don't know a lot about nursing, but the one thing that I do know is that there are lots of different types of nurses. And there are many different types of degrees. I sit in lots of meetings where we talk about the different programs, and they all get confused in my head. So I was wondering if the two of you might help me understand a little bit more about the, the breadth of the nursing profession. Or in, in the process, perhaps explain common misconceptions about what a nurse is or what a nurse does that you would see in the general patient population. So uh, likely a lot of people think a nurse is a nurse is a nurse, right? And so that is a myth. Uh, nurses can be prepared at different levels of education. So we have um, associate's degree nurses, uh, licensed professional nurses, we have registered nurses. And so they all have a license to practice, um, the license coming from the state. Um, however, they have different um, uh, scope of practice or the things that they can do is different. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, typically RNs are prepared at the bachelor's level. And so from the bachelor's level, you can go on and get a master's degree and uh, a doctorate degree that we were kind of just talking about. Who would get a doctorate? I know that both of you have one. So uh, what, uh, how, many, how many nurses actually go, go that route for the advanced degrees? Uh, I would say it's a small percentage, um, and we're trying to grow that. Um, we actually have a shortage of doctorally prepared nurses. We really need them to move into the um, arena for education. Um, our nursing shortage in the clinical setting is really a part of it is because we don't have enough nursing faculty to teach them. And so many students are on wait lists to get into programs um, because we don't have the people to teach them. So an, I thought an RN was an associate's degree and a BSN was the Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, but you just said most RNs are prepared at the baccalaureate level, or am I confused? So interesting, it's such an interesting question because both, both an associate prepared and um, bachelor's prepared uh, registered nurse take the same state board exam. Oh, okay. So their license is the same, but their um, programs are very different and prepare them to be able to take care of a patient with different skill sets. Not so much even just skills, but their preparation to be, I hate to say this in the wrong way, but to be a more professional level uh, nurse at that in practice uh, with a bachelor's degree versus an associate's degree. Okay, so, but they would both just kind of call themselves RNs? Yes, yeah, so right. at the bedside, if I had an associate's degree and Dr. Sherry had a bachelor's degree, you wouldn't know that because their nursing, their their name tags even say registered nurse, so they're considered registered nurses. Okay, interesting. I did not know that. How can I tell if I want a BSN, not an RN? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> at the bedside, I'd be like, what's your degree? <laughs> So nurses really are the front line of medical care. And in, in a hospital setting or even in, in a non-hospital clinical setting, the nurse is the one who's really, in my, from my experience and my understanding, the one with eyes on the patient more so even than in, in many situations than the medical doctor herself. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about what the primary responsibilities of the nurse is in various clinical settings. That's a very broad question. Because <laughs> it depends what kind of medicine, and right? It depends yeah. on what setting, right? So let's just think, typically people think of nurses in a hospital at a bedside taking care of an, Ill, an acutely ill patient. So that nurse, 100% of what she does is related to um, the assessment of that patient. What you just said, the eyes and ears of physicians. Um, and so the ability to have those assessment skills is important, but also knowing how to act, interpret what they see is really important. So educational preparation is, of course, really key. Um, uh, we are actually doing, it's just 
it's kind of an interest brought up another thought with our uh, HRSA grant scholars we're doing a project with them to keen um, and advance their visual observation skills uh, we're doing that with professor leslie colonna using art um, in order to kind of um, improve their ability to assess and observe um, believe it or not nurses do diagnose we we figure out what's wrong with patients and depending on their level of preparation certainly nurse practitioners are considered providers and definitely diagnose but this uh, is something that's been done at Harvard, for example, is incorporated into their med school curriculum um, to use art to help keen those skills for observation. But not only do they assess, they also obviously administer medications and all kinds of treatments, communicate and collaborate with the healthcare team. They usually are the ones telling the physician, here's what's wrong. Can we do this? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And it's so important, too, for patients to like have their nurse advocate for them. I think in my experience of being hospitalized at various times, like depending on what nurse was caring for me, I got different responses from doctors. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So going back to the misconceptions, what in your you know professional life has been some of the biggest misconceptions that you have experienced about the nursing profession? So probably thinking about what Dr. Bobo just said, a majority of Nurses do practice in the, in the hospital setting, but probably a myth is that, you know, nurses only practice in the hospital setting. But there's a good percentage of nurses that also perform, um, you know, see patients in long-term care facilities or, you know, skilled nursing facilities. There's nurses that can practice in home health. There's nurses that can practice in the school setting. There's nurses that can practice in the um, government, right, the county um clinics, the private practice clinics. So there's, you know, inpatient, you know, hospital types of settings, again, where a lot of people practice, but then there's a lot of variety in the outpatient and community settings as well, which is a, a very attractive part of becoming a nurse. So say you're in the hospital for a few years, and perhaps it's really wearing on your, you know, physicality. Um, and as we get older, you know, perhaps you want uh, another challenge, you can always move to another uh, setting um, to keep your practice fresh and learn a new set of skills. And and even uh, more extreme examples in prisons, mm. there's flight nurses who have to be critical care nurses that can take care of um, injured patients, maybe they're trauma patients or, um, you know, so there's, there's just so many different possibility. They, they function as consultants for medical device companies, for pharmaceutical companies. You know, the, it's just endless, really, the possibilities. Do we have a medical office on campus? We have a health center, yes. And who staffs the health center? We do have a nurse practitioner staffing the uh, center seeing patients. We also have a bachelor's um, nurse to support um, her at the, the students really coming in on a walk-in basis. Yeah, so the front line for, for health care on campus for our students are nurses. Yes. So when a student walks into the health center, that's who they're going to see. Yes. Yes. They do have a, the nurse practitioner has a collaborative practice agreement with a physician, Dr. Lott. So, so when you want to, um, th there's obviously a shortage of nurses right now. We hear about it in the media all the time. Uh, nurses are burning out, and one of the reasons that I've, read in in in, uh, in news reports for the reasons why they're burning out is just not enough of them so the demands on the ones who are working are just unreasonable um, so recruiting young people into the profession what would you tell them like why would they why would you suggest that a young person become a nurse Well, it's interesting because they come to us and tell us why they want to be a nurse. The, the, the students that we see, when they come, they're already, they're in it. They're already dedicated to doing it. And the reason that many uh, students give for why I want to be a nurse is that they want to care for people. They have that humanistic um, interest to be connected with another human and to impact their life and to care for another person. That's usually the number one response we hear from students who are interested. In terms of us going out to, say, high schools to recruit 
uh, potential students uh, into the profession, uh, we we give them a huge spiel. Um, I hate to say, we, we do start with that. We start with the ability to impact another human's life when they're most vulnerable and they need care. But we also talk about money. Yeah. Um, because that's a big driver for this generation is that they can make a lot of money to start right right out of school. Um, and it's, you know, the perception of students, it, this generation, let's just say Gen Z, is a positive one of nursing. So even though there were so many um, obstacles and challenges uh, and there's all this burnout in the media, they still admire and and want to be nurses. It's still a profession um, that that the young people want to pursue. Interestingly, at Lewis, we have a national certification uh, for a higher percentage of men in nursing. So we have about 15% of our undergraduate students are may identify as male. And so that's a big positive too. Uh, even yeah. young male uh, young males are interested in pursuing the profession. Yeah, I get some diversity in it. It would be great, I think. Yeah, that's another myth I wanted to at least mention for today, you know, that uh, most nurses are women, which is true. Most w- nurses are n- nurses should not be women. That's not a requirement. You, know, <laughs> you don't have to be a woman to be a nurse. Um, and we certainly welcome, certainly welcome um, males into the into the profession. Well, I say hats off to you guys because I never considered really being in the medical field because you can't stand skin conditions. Like bloods and guts, totally fine. <laughs> Rashes, no thank you. <laughs> and so I definitely, that's what turned me off from healthcare. <laughs> you get desensitized. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do, but right now when I see a bad skin condition, I'm like, I'm literally just going to go take a shower in acid. So... <laughs> With that, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Lewis University. The material and information presented here is for general information purposes only. The Lewis University name and all forms and abbreviations are the property of its owner and its use does not imply endorsement of or opposition to any specific organization, product, or service. This podcast was produced in the WLRA podcast studios at Lewis University. Visit lewisu.edu for more information about Lewis University. You've been listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens, who fears rashes, and Chris White. And our guests today are (laughs) Dr. Daisy Sherry, Dr. Tina Bobo. Thanks. Bye.